but to record it and I'll remember to share my screen as well so that you can see can we record it uh, there we are oh okay good right um did I oh now hang on hang on um I've got I didn't manage to meet you did I I don't think I've managed to meet you all now just bear with no. me a moment um there we go successfully muted I think good right okay so here we go today's talk is on Baroque Sicily um, a little bit different from the previous talks in the sense that um, I'm not going to explain quite so much history today but rather I hope to show you some some slides some photos and also some maps um, and just show uh, show and tell is really um, the idea of today's talk um, but before we make a start on that let's redefine make sure we all understand what we mean by baroque um, because it, it's one of those terms that gets used in a lot of different um, different variations if you like so um, basically it, um, the, the period of history that we're referring to is the 17th and the 18th centuries and it was a movement mainly in southern Europe but not entirely um, which was a reaction to the Reformation which was happening in northern Europe very very loosely speaking and whereas the Reformation set to um, a, a rather dour tone on, on things the Baroque was really a contrast to this. So it was a, a movement of, um, of flourishes, of embellishment, and of, of, of great expression um, in, in all of the art forms. Um, so today we're, we're going to find ourselves talking about, uh, I think, mainly architecture. I mean, that's the way it expresses itself in Sicily. But let's not also forget that um, the same principles apply to other art forms, in particular painted art, sculpture, um, but also of course um, music. And in fact music is, it provides us with quite a good example. I always think um, a good way of explaining Baroque is to think of a solid bass line that just repeats over and over and again, and the solo instrument over the top did a a violin or an oboe or a recorder or something like that, making embellishments to the line. So ornaments and florid lights of, of expression. And very much it's that kind of thing that um, architects and artists uh, were trying to give form to in their, their buildings and paintings. Now, uh, by its very definition, I think we're going to spend most of our time today in the southeast of Sicily um, for very good reasons, which I'm going to explain to you. Many of you probably know this already. But before we go to the southeast of Sicily, I want to make a start in Palermo because we're going to come back to Palermo at the end of the talk. Um, and also the Baroque period in, in art really begins in Palermo in Sicily and in particular with a painter by the name of Pietro Novelli who was born in Monreale in 1603. He didn't live very long, he only lived 44 years, but he had a very prodigious output, um, mainly religious paintings. Um, there's hardly a church in Palermo that doesn't have a painting by Pietro Novelli. And I put this painting here um, just as, as an example to you. So you'll see typical full of nuns, angels, uh, priests, and, and so on and so forth. Um, 
as well as churches though, he also painted commissions for noble and aristocratic families. So you'll very often come across those. Um, I don't know um, any, any of you who have traveled with us and have been to visit the Duke and Duchess in Palermo. I don't know if you noticed, but they have one of Pietro Novelli's paintings on, on their wall. So very, very common, very prodigious painter. Um, he's painting about 100 years, approximately, very approximately, before much of what I'm going to show you, um, much of the architecture, many of the buildings that I'm going to show you later on today. But very much it informs, um, the philosophy of it informs what we are going to, to see. But as I say, we're going to come back to Palermo uh, at the end of the talk. So um, let's go to the southeast of Sicily. And why do we find such a concentration of Baroque architecture in the southeast of Sicily? Well, um, it's a very simple answer, actually. And it all boils down to one event. And this was an earthquake in 1693, or rather two earthquakes, um, because uh, there were two shocks happening three nights apart from each other. The first one on the 11th of January, 1693, and second one three nights later on the 14th of January. We don't know for absolutely sure, but um, geologists think they have identified the epicenter as being just offshore, just off the eastern shore from the city of Augusta. Um, and you'll see from the, the colouring, the shading of this map of Sicily, the strength of this earthquake. So where the darker colours, the red, are obviously um, where the effects of this earthquake were felt the strongest. Um, and then as it gets successively lighter in shading, obviously the, the, the effects were felt a little bit less. But the deep red and the orange colouring here, you will see takes up most of the southeast of Sicily. This earthquake pretty much flattened every single building that had been there. So as a result, today, everything that we see in this area has been built post 1693. Interestingly, with the exception of, if you cast your mind back to the first lecture, the, the lecture on the Greek uh, Syracusa, and you remember I showed you some photos of the temples, the Greek temples in Syracusa. They withstood the earthquake, but very few buildings did, and um, and really it was only only, only those ones. So um, the point about this is that the rebuilding program began in earnest from shortly after 1693. I mean, to all intents and purposes, it was from 1700 onwards. So from the beginning of the 18th century onwards. And as a result, we have a very homogenous architecture in this area. And that's what gives the towns their character. And um, those of you who have watched the Montalbano um, television series, Inspector Montalbano, you will know very much what I'm talking about. Characterized by very beautiful um, cream colored, slightly pink tinged local limestone. So um, let's just try and identify more specifically the towns that we are going to visit. Um, you'll see from this map that of course, pretty much the whole area was, was um, affected by the earthquake. But there are certain towns that we can identify with the resurgence of the, uh, what we call the Baroque architecture. And I've underlined these in red on our map. So um, just starting on the right hand side, on the eastern side of the coast, um, Syracusa is 
an important um, town for Baroque architecture. We don't necessarily identify it with that because we tend to think of Greeks, that we tend to think of the um, Greek theatre, the Greek te temples and so on and so forth. But uh, wandering around Ortigia, it is full of um, examples of Baroque architecture, and I'll show you some uh, as well. Um, to the west of that, two towns up in the hills, up in the, these are the Iblian Mountains, these ones here. Um, small, really just a village called Bushemi, and a larger town by the name of Palazzolo a Crede, uh, which have some lovely examples of Baroque architecture, and I'll show you some of those. Moving further south, um, Noto. Noto, I think, is the uh, classic example, and I've got lots of, lots of photos of Noto to show you, um, and, and we'll spend quite a bit of time looking at um, Noto. To the west of Noto, two other classic towns with plenty of examples, towns of Modica and Ragusa. I've got photos to show you of those. Ragusa, actually, um, we ought to be clear, is actually two towns. Uh, there is Ragusa and Ragusa Ibla, and they just sit on two adjacent hilltops. The old town is Ragusa Ibla, and that's the town I think is um, probably the more interesting of the two. I've got some photos to show you of that as well. Um, we shouldn't discount Shikli, this lovely town hiding away down towards the coast. I think it's fair to say that uh, we, don't, we don't visit Shikli as, as often as perhaps we should. It's a beautiful town, very small, uh, lots of little delights, some gems, some beautiful uh, ecclesiastical architecture. And for those of you who do follow Montalbano, of course it's very important because um, Inspector Montalbano's office um, was filmed inside the mayor's office of the town hall of, of Shikli. And so that's where that uh, takes place. Finally, uh, we shouldn't forget the town of Ispica. There's a couple of lovely examples of Baroque architecture in, in Ispica. Now that's not to say that's an exhaustive list. There are plenty of other, other examples of Baroque architecture around Sicily. Um, also not forgetting Catania, which is slightly off the map. But these are the main, the, the main concentration of them. And if we're gonna go in search of Baroque architecture, uh, these are the towns that we go to visit. But before we go and visit those towns, I want to take you to um, a town before the 1693 earthquake. And this is a little town uh, just here on our map called Noto Antica. So the old Noto, the Noto before the earthquake. And you'll see that it, it, it is 13 kilometers north of the town of Noto. What happened after the earthquake, they decided that it really wasn't safe to rebuild the town on the old site. So they, they moved all the population, lock, stock and barrel, 13 kilometers down the valley, and they completely built, rebuilt the town on the new site. But first of all, I want to uh, take you and show you a little bit of Noto Antica. So this is all that remains of what was once upon a time a fabulous city. And we know it was a fabulous city because Noto, not Antica, before the earthquake, was a provincial capital. It was the capital of the Val di Noto. Now, um, some of you might remember a few lectures ago when um, we were talking about the Normans and we briefly mentioned that before the Normans, the Arabs had divided Sicily into three and governed it from a capital in each of, the, each of those three provinces, if you like. And Noto was the capital 
of the southeast of Sicily for the Arabs and it remained a very important city under the Normans and also later on under the Spanish. And this is, the, they were responsible for some fabulous, uh, what, what would have once upon a time been fabulous fortifications of this city. But nowadays they are entirely in ruins and there is pretty well nothing to see um, except the remains. This is the two photos that I'm showing you are just about all that remains of it. Uh, this once upon a time was, must have been a very formidable Norman keep. And then after that, um, a Spanish castle built inside it. Um, but as you can see, really very, very little left of it. Just to give you some idea of the magnitude of this earthquake. So um, after the events of 1693, as I said, the people of North are decided to build their town down the hill on a completely new site. Now this had a quite extraordinary effect and I want to show you this slide here which is um, dare I say the Google um, satellite view of the city of Norto as it stands today. Of course the outlying areas are, um, are modern but nevertheless what you can see here, this is still the very much the 18th century street plan. And this was something that was quite new for Sicily because previously all the old Sicilian cities and towns had been built on what was once upon a time the Arab street plan. Now the, Arab, um, the Arabs when they built their towns, villages and cities and so forth, they they devised a street plan very much to um, confuse any eventual invader, to lead them up blind alleys, to lead them into cul-de-sacs cul or to, to make them lost. But when the architects decided to redesign uh, Nauta, they built it on a grid plan. And this was something very, very new for Sicily. So we have the main thoroughfare on an east-west axis and then we have these crossroads on a north-south axis. What you can't quite see from this view is that the northern side of the town is actually higher up the hill um, and the southern part is down the hill. So um, you would quite easily imagine that the aristocratic families would build their palaces on the higher ground of the town to afford a better view over the roofs of the houses down here. And that's exactly what happened. So there are a few beautiful noble palaces up on this side. And of course also any wastewater would also have flowed downhill. So um, walking along the main street of Dorto, um, you tend to find that the most noble buildings and indeed the cathedral itself are on the right hand side of the, the main street. Now all of this is in contrast to Ragusa Ibla which is this one here and I'm showing you a, a satellite view of, of Ragusa Ibla where they decided to rebuild on the old town plan. And look here, you can see um, these are the original, I mean, probably earlier than Arabs, I would say, probably going back to Byzantine times, some of these streets. The only new street that was put in after the earthquake in the 18th century was this one here, the wide thoroughfare which leads up to the Church of St. George, which I will we'll come and talk about a bit later on. So two quite different approaches to town planning at the beginning of the 18th century. Let's go and look in a little bit more detail at um, what we mean by um, Baroque architecture. How does it manifest itself? So here we're going to go back to Noto and what we're looking at here 
is the Church of St Francis of Assisi and the Monastery of San Salvatore, St Saviour. And I wanted to show you this photo because I think it, it, it demonstrates some very good um, examples of what we mean by um, Baroque architecture. Just before we, we pinpoint these though, one of the interesting things about Sicilian Baroque is that it was very much a fusion between what had been happening in, in further north in Italy, in Rome and in Milan, and what was also happening in Spain. Because we should remind ourselves that um, up until the 17th century, of course, Sicily was still ruled over by the Spanish viceroys. So there was a hugely Spanish influence in the, the architecture and the rebuilding um, after the 1693 earthquake. So we have these, this is typical of um, the, the churches, is that they tended to be built up on higher ground and there would be a flight of steps leading up to it. Um, sometimes very impressive, sometimes with a beautiful curved um, line to it, but always made to make the church stand out on, on top. Um, many people have quipped actually that that's why um, the elder generation in Sicily are, are so fit because uh, they've spent many years climbing up these steps to get to mass. Look at these columns either side of the door. Um, to totally superfluous in terms of structure. They're not doing anything. They're not holding anything up. Um, purely decorative. That is their sole function is just to add decoration. Um, look at the scrolls at the top of the, on the capitals. Again, these um, purely, purely for, for, de for decoration on the facade of, of the church. Notice here on the facade of the monastery, the um, the, the convex shape of it. Um, notice the fabulous decoration over the top of the windows here and also this wrought ironwork which is very much a feature of Baroque architecture. So these are just some of the features, I'll point out a few more um, as we go on. So it has to be said um, a lot of the Baroque architecture in southeast Sicily was ecclesiastical. It was either churches or monasteries or nunneries. Why? Well, quite simply, the church was <laughs> were the people who had the money to pay for all this rebuilding. So you might ask, where did all this money come, come from? Well, the church was phenomenally rich. Um, in Sicily, uh, throughout the 15th, 16th, 17th century, um, all families were tended to be large, but in particular, aristocratic families tended to be large. And the tendency was for many of the children to go into the church to either become priests or nuns. And when they joined the church, the family would donate a dowry to the church, which could be either land or money. And this, of course, secured the head of the family's place in heaven um, by, by the giving of this dowry. Now, ironically, uh, some, of the, some of the families, all of the children went into the church. And, and this was absolutely the reason why some of the families completely died out. Um, I mentioned the Duke and Duchess before, who some of you will have met, but a good example of that is the Tomasi family. Um, all of the children went into the church and the family entirely died out. Um, so that explains a little bit um, where the money came from to do all this fabulous rebuilding program. Um, just before I move away from this slide, just one thing to, to mention. Um, a very common thing that you'll see throughout Sicily are these wrought iron grids over the windows. This is not 
because it was a prison. <laughs> um, it, you, you will see it, it will show, it will be either a place where monks were living or nuns were living. And it afforded them a view onto the street, but it meant that the commoners in the street below wouldn't be able to look up and identify and see people in the monastery or nunnery. And you see that it's very, very common. You see it in churches, up in the choir stalls. You'll see it as well, that kind of thing. It's um, always to shield the faces of, um, of the nuns or, or the monks. It always reminds me a little bit um, of, um, of a harem in an Ottoman sarai. Um, but of course, it had a very different function to that. Um, so let's move on. Let's carry on walking through Noto. A um, little bit down the street, we come to the beautiful, uh, this is the Cathedral of Norto, the Duomo of Norto, with a, a beautiful facade. And here you can see the beautiful colour of the stone. It has a very definite pink tinge to it. Um, true to say that this has all been restored relatively recently, it's all been cleaned up, uh, but nevertheless, beautiful colour to the stone. Notice also this fabulous flight of steps going up to the <clears throat> to the to the to the, um, to the entrance. Uh, what you can't see unfortunately in this photo is there's a cupola, a dome at the back here, um, which actually in 1996 collapsed and, and, and that was actually the, the motive for them uh, restoring the, the cathedral and that's one of the reasons why it is so beautifully restored like this. Um, so what I want to do now is um, I'm going to show you the facades of several churches in the area and you could just contrast and compare um, the different architectural styles. So this one here is the absolute epitome of a Baroque church in Sicily. This is from Ragusa, Ragusa Ibla, and it is the uh, mother church, the Duomo, the church dedicated to Saint George or San Giorgio as he's known in Sicilian. Um, notice that it's built on three tiers. I always think it looks absolutely like a, a wedding cake. Um, notice the scrolls here, the convex um, oh, sorry, let me close that. Um, the, um, the other feature of um, Baroque churches in um, Sicily was that prior to this period, the, they had always put the, in, in Italy anyway, the bell tower had always been adjacent to the church. But it, from the 18th century, century onwards, they began to incorporate the bells into the facade of the church. It became a, a decorative feature. Those of you who have been watching Montalbano, you will recognize this absolutely um, because the number of times he drives along this road just beneath here. And this building here um, features in, in many of the episodes. Um, I can't just remember whose house it is, but it, <laughs> you'll recognize it, those of you who know. Um, just to say, the, um, the cupola is later, actually, it's from the late 18th century, um, not really in the Baroque style, it, it verges on the neoclassical. Um, another church from Ragusa Ibla, again, um, I forgot to mention the architect, uh, but it's the same architect for, for nearly all of these. Rosario Gagliardi is the one who was working in Ragusa in the 18th century. This is the church of San Giuseppe and pretty much a photocopy of, of San Giorgio. Notice the, the bells, the three tiers, concave, sorry, the convex uh, facade. Um, I'm going to go now to Siracusa. And this is a building that you will remember. You will know this building, but you probably won't recognize it. If I tell you that 
this is just the facade and that the interior of this building is very, very different, it might ring a few bells. This, believe it or not, is the Temple of Athena built in the 5th century BC by the Greeks. But, and it, it, it withstood the 1693 earthquake. Do you remember I took you inside and I showed you how the Normans had cut the arches out of the naos to make the name? Well, that's what's inside here. That resisted the, the earthquake. And the only part that fell down was a, a facade that had been put on by the Normans. And in the 18th century, it was an architect from Palermo, actually, Andrea Paola, who um, created this fabulous facade, uh, Baroque facade. Um, but of course, nothing to do with, with the Greeks. Um, this chap up on the left hand side is uh, Bishop Zosimo. He was a, a Byzantine bishop of um, Syracuse, archbishop, I should say. And this lady here up on the left, on the right hand side, is Saint Lucy, the dedicatee of the Cathedral of, um, of Syracuse. So I'm going to move on because we, there's quite a few examples here. Here we are going to Mardica. This is the Church of San Pietro. Um, slightly different style, different, very different colour of stone, much redder stone, isn't it here? But you identify the same, the same kinds of features here. This is, the, um, this is actually the Cathedral of, of Mardica. And one other... Um, so I'm, I'm going, jumping around a little bit here, so excuse me if I do. Um, we're now going to go to um, Palazzolo Acrede um, and look at the church, Church of San Paolo there, built by another architect, um, an architect from Noto actually, by the name of Vincenzo Sinatra. Very easy to remember his surname, I don't know if he was related in any way to, to Frank, but it's quite possible because Frank Sinatra's family did come from this part of Sicily. But again, you identify very much the same features, the scrolls, the columns, um, the bells in the facade and so forth. Um, just one more facade before we leave the church architecture for the moment. I want to go back to Mordica and show you this one, which I think is the, the finest of them all. This is um, the Church of San Giorgio in Modica, um, again designed by Rosario Gagliardi. It's a very, very difficult church to photograph because um, where I'm standing here is actually on the other, other side of the valley um, because this, this overlooks um, a beautiful valley and you can see this is just the very top flight of steps. There's, um, I forget how many flights of steps, but hundreds and hundreds to get up to this church. And the unique feature about San Giorgio in Modica is that either side of the nave, it was flanked by this double aisle. So there are four aisles in all, and to my knowledge, this is the only church in Sicily to have this feature. Um, again, this is another, um, those of you who watch Montalbano, you recognize this. Uh, this, this building here features a lot in, in um, Montalbano. So, um, as I said, um, Baroque, predominantly ecclesiastical architecture, um, but not solely. And I want to show you a few examples of, um, of non-ecclesiastical architecture from around and about this area. And the first example is from the town of Ispica. And this is a rather lovely, what we call loggiata, which is basically it's an entranceway. Um, to, to the, um, actually to the church, 
but it didn't have an ecclesiastical function in any way. In fact, probably at one time it was used as a market. Quite possibly uh, these were um, the stall holders' doorways, if you like, and then they brought their wares out into the, into the um, open space here. This was designed in the mid eight, um, 18th century by, again, by Vincenzo Sinatra, and it's it's a very 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 beautiful um, design. I think this semicircular. Uh, it, it's just semicircular. It doesn't doesn't go all the way round. But beautiful stone as well. Nowadays, not really serving any purpose, um, except to feature a lot in Montalbano films. <laughs> um, so I mentioned that the church had money to rebuild, but of course um, the local aristocracy also did, and they made. Uh, plenty of opportunity to rebuild their palaces and um, I think it's fair to say that the interior of many of these palaces has been uh, has been altered over the course of time so there are very few examples of Baroque decoration inside these private palaces but the exteriors still um, retain a lot of the features um, and these are typical features of uh, Baroque. So these, what we call corbels, uh, beautifully decorated, very flourishing, with um, acanthus leaves, flowers, so forth, and um, these these nymphs, and the beautiful wrought ironwork over the top. This is on the Palazzo Nicolacci in Noto, just um, just a few doors down from the cathedral, and this is another. Um, balcony from the same palace, at this time these rampant lions, each one slightly different, uh, but all very stunning. This has been recently cleaned up and it's, it's one of those um, beautiful examples of, of it. I ought to mention just while we're on it, um, notice the shape of the wrought iron work here. This was of course because in the 18th century um, ladies dresses were made of that beautiful crinoline which flowed out um, and it, it meant that they could stand on the edge of the balcony, balcony and look out and their dresses would neatly fit into this space here without rubbing up against the iron and getting dirty. So all practicalities were, were thought of you see in the, in the design. Um, here's another corbel from, this one is from Ragusa, <laughs> this, is, this is very funny, it's from just be behind the cathedral. <laughs> I've no idea who this chap is, <laughs> but they say, that, I mean, there, there are several balconies there, there, and they say that they are all local people um, from, you know, from roundabouts, and you can absolutely be believe it, this chap has certainly never seen a dentist in his life. So um, if, you, if you go to this area, don't just look at the churches, do look at the, um, in particular, the balconies of some of these palazzi. Um, we should not uh, forget Catania, actually. Um, Catania is a is slightly maligned town, actually, in the sense that we, we arrive at the airport in Catania and then make a beeline out of it. But there are some beautiful examples of Baroque architecture in Catania, um, including this one. This is Palazzo Biscari with some beautiful decorations around the doorways here. Uh, very difficult to photograph this actually. This is not my photograph, I'm afraid I just took it from Wikipedia because it is built, Palazzo Biscari, on the, this is the old town wall. Um, you can see the volcanic stone from Etna on, on which it is, it is built. Um, so uh, let's go back now to Noto and I want to show you an example. This is of municipal architecture, so um, neither ecclesiastical nor aristocratic private palaces or so on. This is the town hall of Noto, again designed by the architect Vincenzo Sinatra. Um, 
rather unusually here, you, you, you can tell the building was built in two distinct stages. Um, they're quite distinct. You've got these beautiful rounded arches here and then these sort of square um, tops to the window frames here. Um, but nevertheless, a very fine building. And this is exactly opposite the cathedral. So you stand on the cathedral steps and you look back and you see the, the beautiful town hall of Norton. What I haven't shown you yet is the interior of some of these buildings. I'd, I'd like to show you some of those. But just before I do that, um, I'm afraid I don't have um, many photographs of Sheikli, but I, I did, and this is unashamedly culled from Wikipedia, um, but just to show you a little bit what, what it's like, uh, there are some beautiful churches to explore in Sheikli as well. So it's quite a small town, you can walk across it in, in 10 minutes. But so it's certainly well worth a visit. So the interior of these Baroque churches, uh, this is the interior of San Giorgio, of Modica, and you can see that it takes um, embellishment and decoration and flourish absolutely to extreme. No corner is left undecorated in the Sicilian Baroque churches. And I think it's fair, fair to say that it's not really to everybody's taste. Um, but nevertheless, um, it does have a certain colour to it. But I'm going to leave now the South East and I'm going to go back to Palermo because Palermo was never affected by the earthquake in the same way that the southeast of uh, Sicily was. So um, we don't think of Palermo as characteristically a Baroque city, but yet of course within Palermo there are some very fine examples of Baroque architecture. Uh, not so much the exteriors of the churches, but the interiors. And um, I want to show you this one. This is the interior of Santa Caterina, um, just at the back of Piazza Pretoria, a stone's throw, throw from the Martorana church. And something quite different was happening in Palermo. Um, bear in mind that they never had to rebuild their churches, so they, they were never they never had any kind of setback, if you like. They were always kind of adding embellishment to embellishment. And what we have in Palermo, uh, it, I appreciate it's not terribly easy to see in this photo, but we have beautiful inlaid marble. So this is, um, this is local marble from um, Custonaci, which is um, just 30 or 40 miles to the west of Palermo. Beautiful reds, whites, greys, and even greens as well, um, made into beautiful geometric ornamental shapes. So that, that's the first thing that you see of, of, um, of, of the interior of the Baroque churches in Palermo. But you also begin to see this stucco um, decoration, which is what you can see up around here. Um, the Church of Santa Caterina is a, a very fine example of all of this, all of these styles put together. Um, I want to show you an example of some of this stucco work done. This, this is not actually from Palermo. This is from Castel Buono, and it's in a slightly more rustic style compared to, to that of Palermo. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you, you, you get the idea of it. This is the chapel of St Anna in the castle of Castelbuono. Um, but what I, what I really want to, what I, where I'm really heading is to show you the apotheosis of this white stucco work because it was with a sculptor by the name of Giacomo Serpotta, that this really um, came into its element. Now, 
So Giacomo Serpota was working around the same time that those churches were being built in the southeast of Sicily. But what he was doing was something quite different. And it was quite extraordinary. He never traveled anywhere as far as we know. And as a consequence, um, he, his work never spread outside Palermo. You only find examples of it in the city of Palermo. And he, he had a workshop. We work, he worked with his, we, we think with his sons and other members of his family. And he had a particular way of making this stucco work. And we never completely uh, discovered how he did it. These are not carvings. Uh, these, this is stucco work. So very loosely, he started off with a wire frame or a wooden skeleton, if you like. And then he probably added wire loosely over it to give some sort of form to, 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 the, to the eventual sculpture. And then he um, covered it over with a, with a sort of plaster, very rough plaster or rough mortar, um, basically to give it more and more its shape. And then he used stucco, stucco being um, marble plaster, essentially. So very, very finely ground master, uh, marble mixed with all kinds of uh, things, possibly egg yolk and so forth, to giving it, give it um, some sort of sticking, cloying property. And then he began to mould and to form these beautiful um, sculptures. And then finally, uh, he, he, he then polished the whole thing off. And that's what gives it this, this beautiful luminescent quality. And he decorated the interior of quite a few churches in, um, in Palermo. And I think, but I think the apotheosis has to be what we call the Oratorio of Santa Cita. Um, this, 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 is, this is the one in the previous slide here. Quite extraordinary work. This is the, actually depicting the Battle of Lepanto. Um, remember from 1571, this was the victory of the Christian fleet over the Muslims um, that marked the demise of the Ottoman navy in the, in the, in the uh, Mediterranean. But um, it's quite extraordinary. It must have taken him, we, we don't know exactly how many years it would have taken him to complete this, but quite a few years, as I said, he would have had his whole family working on it, but um, nevertheless, an absolutely astonishing effect here. And um, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm slightly sort of going beyond my time, but I, I just want to finish off with, um, while we're in the region of Palermo, to show you some private uh, palazzi or villas from the region of Palermo and a town by the name of Bagheria, which is about 30 kilometers to the east of Palermo. We don't tend to visit it, um, I'm ashamed to say. It, um, it, it's, in some ways it's quite a scruffy town. It, 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 um, it was a town that came into being in the 18th century because the noble classes of Palermo started to build their villas outside here. But in subsequent years, I'm afraid to say, um, it's attracted something of an underclass and it, it, it's, quite a, it, it's made quite a, a name for itself, I get here. Um, but nevertheless, these, these villas do exist. Unfortunately, the, um, the owners of these classes, because they're private villas, Many of them have just not be able to pay for the upkeep, and a lot of them are in um, quite a dire state. Um, hence, it's, it's really very hard to go and visit them. But probably the most famous of them is this one, the Villa Palagonia, um, and it's famous for these 
sculptures, uh, these what are called the monsters of Villa Palagonia. Um, uh, these beautiful <laughs> Baroque monsters uh, decorating some of the walls of, of the villa. But um, just to finish off with, I want to show you um, a slide of this absolutely stunning villa, Villa Valguarnera in Bagheria, um, which was uh, started, started to be de designed by Tommaso Nap Napoli, um, and he died before it was complete, and it was finished by Vaccarini, Giovanni Battista Vaccarini in the end of the 18th century. This palace is owned by, um, well, it was the Prince Aliata, and it is now in the possession of the Princess Vittoria or Victoria Aliata. And I went to visit her a couple of years ago with the idea that we might be able to take people to dinner in this palace. What she does is she, she puts on dinners there and uh, you dine and you enjoy this beautiful splendor. Unfortunately, the prices she charge <laughs> mean that it's, it, it's, it's absolutely prohibitive. But you understand why she's able to charge such um, an extraordinary amount of money. She, she told me an extraordinary story about this villa, which is the note I want to finish off with. So um, this first floor here is the, what we call the piano nobile, the noble floor. And what you can't see is at the back a fabulous terrace which looks out straight onto the sea. And she took me on a little walk through the right, through the little door here, into the garden, up onto a little hill, um, a man-made hill. <clears throat> and she showed me, she showed me to look down, and there were some ugly 20. 20th century modern villas which had been built in her garden and she said to me she said that was the or those were the, the villas of the the mafia bosses what had happened at, in the sort of 1970s and 1980s they had simply taken over her garden and built their 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 villas there and she was completely powerless to do anything about it. And the story doesn't stop there. She was still living in the villa at the time with her mother. They were inhabiting the servants' quarters down below. But the mafia, every so often, would come in, open up the piano nobile, and just hold their summits on the terrace overlooking the sea and they were party to everything they heard everything that was going on of course they could do absolutely nothing and there was no question of calling the carabinieri and saying oh by the way there's a mafia summit going on above us <laughs> there was no question of that um, but uh, she couldn't do anything about it of course um, with the fall of the mafia in the 1990s they were cleared out of the villas um, and, but nevertheless, poor old Princess Aliata still hasn't managed to clear up all the um, wreckage that they left behind from their, from their summits and their parties. I think that's why she charges so much money that, um, she, <laughs> to try and put things back to rights. So, um, on that colourful note, I will finish my, my presentation. And um, I will allow you to unmute yourselves. If anybody has a story, a question rather, by all means, um, wave your, wave your um, um, arms and unmute yourself and fire away. Damien, I've just got a quick one because I missed the name of it. Yes, when you're yes. in Notto, 
Yes. Uh, there were some balconies and they, with all the beautiful uh, statues underneath, which I forgot the name of. Yes. Um, what was the name of the Palazzo? Okay. Um, that was, um, and I've just forgotten it as well. Um, <laughs> it's, um, somebody so, help uh, me. <laughs> It'll come back to me. Um, it's just gone clear out of my, mo my mind. I've had a senior moment. Um, Nicolacci. 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 Yes. Yes. That's it. So um, Nicolacci of Villa Dorata. That's it. And the Nicolacci family were a rich family who had made their money from tuna fishing in Marzameri. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever oh, lovely, that, uh, me. That My sorted speaker. me out with that. Yes. <laughs> Um, next question. Anybody else? Damien. Yes. Oh, Damien. Terry. Nice to see you. Yes. The stucco that you've referred to, is that all created in situ or is it created as pieces and then put in situ? Yes, absolutely, Terry. I, I think it must have been created in a workshop and then brought in and put in in situ. I don't think it would have been possible to have done all of that work in situ. But I don't know. I might be, I might be completely wrong about that. Um, but I think, I think that's one of the things that we, we simply don't know the answer to. There are a lot of, a lot of questions about it's, how- it's Damien, um, it's, very, it's very like the Figurini di Gesso that um, Luca exported all over the world. It, it, absolutely, it is. In the same system to make it as well. It is absolutely, and in fact, Hazel, you've reminded me of one of the very important ingredients there, because gesso, which is the word you used, which is the Italian word for it, is our word, the English word, is gypsum, and gypsum is the, the ingredient in it. That's, that's what makes it stick, and I, I should have mentioned it. Yes, absolutely. Well done. Okay, you take Thank you. Anybody else? Oh yes, Caroline. Yes, nice to see you. Yes. Thank Hi. you. My question is, I noticed some of the architecture is very simple, yet there are others that are extremely ornated. Um, did it depend on the builder? Um, I think probably it, it depended on the patron and just quite simply <laughs> how much money they were able to, to pay. And the more money that they had, the more decoration they would be able to afford. I, I think it's just as simple as that, to be honest. Um, if you didn't have a lot of money, you didn't get a lot of decoration. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah. Anybody else? Christine, have you got a question? No, I'm just not a, a very beautiful place. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It just is. Yes. Mm. With very good ice cream. Oh, <laughs> you, so you discovered the Cafe Sicilia as well, which is just across the road from the from the um, Villa Nicolacci. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, right. we second that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you've been there as well. You've, oh, you've... Yes, with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other reason for visiting these towns as well is is just purely to go and taste the ice cream. That, that's a completely valid reason. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Damien. Yes. Damien, I, I, happen, I happened to be in Ragusa and Modica last November. Ah, oh, right. And uh, now one of those towns is famous for its chocolate. Is it Modica? Yes, yes it is. Yes, it yes. is. Absolutely. Well, well mentioned, Penny. Yes. Um, and again, this is the Spanish influence. Of course, um, cocoa was brought in from the Americas by the Spanish uh, in the 16th century, and they brought it to southern Sicily. And, um, and the tradition has persisted. And, and nowadays, as, as you rightly say, uh, there is a great tradition of chocolate making in Mardica. And if you go to visit Mardica, I do recommend you try the chocolate. 
it has a very unusual consistency consistency to it, very unlike um, any chocolate that you've, you've ever tasted before. It's, it's a little bit grainy, it's a bit strange. Yes. It doesn't just melt in the mouth, does it? Um, no. But it's, it's absolutely delicious. And there's also all kinds of exotic flavors. So you can get citrus flavor and you can get uh, carob flavor and you can also get spicy pepper flavor as well, which is, I always think is a lot of fun. <laughs> I think we've just got time for one last question, if anybody would like to fire away, otherwise we'll... Um... This isn't a question, but I just wanted to say thank you for showing the pictures of the oratorio in Palermo, oh, which I right. think was one of the most fabulous places I went in Sicily, honestly. I couldn't oh. tear my eyes away from those... <laughs> I just... <laughs> thank you, Deborah. Fabulous, thank you. fabulous. fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, a lot of people do um, agree with that. And um, in, I mean, it's it, absolutely astonishing that up until six or seven years ago, it was very difficult to get into that auditorium because it was just left closed up. Nobody was interested in it. Nobody thought that it was interesting. And then suddenly now it's all been discovered and cleaned up and and, uh, and of course, I mean, everybody realizes that it's a, it's yeah, an it's absolute wonderful. gem, a must visit in, in Sicily. So thank you, thank you for, for underlining that, Deborah. yes. Well, thanks, Damien, for the tour. That was lovely. Oh, Very thank you, Hazel. Thank you, Very yes, nice. yes. We well. enjoyed it all. There were some places we didn't go next time. <laughs> well, you're just gonna have to come back and visit, Hazel, yes. <laughs> So the, the, the Oratory of Santa Cita, Hazel, was one of the yep. places that was not open when you came to visit Tim. Yes, it was. And it, but yes, we did go. I have pictures. Yes, we did Oh, we go. did go, did we? Uh, but we only went because the, the Duchess had lost a brother-in-law and the funeral was taking place. So you gave us that choice and we went there. Ah, so we did see ah that was done. that day. Yeah, and, yeah. and the extraordinary thing was the extraordinary thing was that the vault of the family is oh, in right. the crypt of, of that church. Yes. So there were flowers, right. white so, flowers everywhere. That's, that's right. right. That's right. So your memory is better than mine, Hazel. Well, that is seven <laughs> <Yes>. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, before we go, um, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, a real you. pleasure to see you all looking so well. Um, do join us next week. Now, next week's lecture is a little bit of a change of gear because we're going to go and visit prehistoric Sicily. And I wanted to include one on, on prehistoric Sicily because I wanted to show you places that we really don't go on a lot of our tours. So I'm going to take you to the island of Levenso, to some caves there. Hmm. I'm going to take you to um, a prehistoric site on the island of Panarea in yeah. the Aeolian Islands. Yeah. And I'm going to take you to Pantalica, which I think is an extraordinary site, um, just about 30 kilometers to the west of, of Siracusa, but nevertheless, a very unusual and interesting site. So those are three of the places we're going to go and visit next mm. week. So keep tuned. Um, Remember to look out for that email. I'll send it along with the link. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank and you, have a nice evening. Thank, thank you, Damien. Thank you, thank you Damien. Bye. Bye. Okay, then. Bye -bye. Nice to see you, Tina. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.